Um, so I, I'm going to um, talk, uh, um, it kind of complements what Gaminda said, but it's, it's a little bit more um, about ethics and, and violence and politics, basically. Um, and we might know that the, 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 the kind of one of the marks of, of modern civilization, apparently, um, is restraint in the pursuit of extreme violence not just domestically with liberal laws and due process, but perhaps even more importantly, the international community indicts those who are responsible for war crimes, aggression, disproportionate use of force, and above all, genocide. That's the claim. Now, now most of the time, just wars or military interventions are defined in opposition to the bad guys who are unrestrained in their use of force, often against women and children. And the good people are invariably the international community, that's what they call themselves, led as it happens by former imperial centres and especially Anglo settler colonies. Now, keep that conceit in mind about what the hallmarks of modern civilization um, as, as we jump back into the Haitian Revolution. And I, I want to ask, what, what ethics would you hold on to? as you confront genocidal violence, violence that's been inflicted on you, would you hold on to any ethics of engagement? And on this point, I want to reflect on a ritual chant of enslaved Congo peoples recorded by a white Creole lawyer in Sandaman, which is what Haiti was called before Haiti, um, just a few years before the famous meeting at Bois Cayman that inaugurates the Haitian Revolution. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna share this this chant. Hold on. So here it is. Hey, hey, bomba, kanga bafiote, kanga mundela, kanga dokila, kanga li. Now in CLR James's Black Jacobins, the chant is translated as it usually is to this: We swear to destroy the whites and all they possess. Let us die rather than fail to keep this vow. But when glossed in the Kikongo language, the language of the people, uh, uh, the majority of people who are enslaved in Sandamang, there unfolds a much more enigmatic meaning. So it's hey and bomba, hold back, hold back the black men, hold back the white man, hold back that witch, hold them. The verb kanga has multiple and overlapping meetings, meanings in 18th century Kikongo. In all, all dialects, kanga can be glossed as to stop or to bind. And in Haitian voodoo, binding is also a practical means to concentrate cosmic power, for example, in charms, amulets, and also within and around the body itself. Now, amongst Christian Kikongo speakers, and Christianity is already being indigenized in Congo before 1492, Amongst Christian Kikongo speakers, the word kanga would also infer salvation, to protect, to deliver. So to bind infers all at the same time to concentrate power, to stop, to protect and to deliver. To concentrate power, to stop, to protect and to deliver. OK, but who are to be bound and by whose authority? Well, the latter, that's clear. Mbomba references a Kikongo name for the distant creating force, which is consonant with the other name, Bondier, the good God. What are the others? Bafiotti, black men, references specifically enslaved Africans. Moon, a Creole word for person from the Kikongo Muntu, infers in this context a white man and a witch. Well, in the lands that spoke Kikongo, maleficent spiritual practice was apprehended as a practice of secret societies that promoted individual gain. And this was in distinction to spiritual practices that were more open and directed towards personal healing or collective welfare. Now, merchants were especially vulnerable to being accused as maleficent practitioners due to their mobility and seemingly individualistic behavior. And by the late 18th century, all those involved in the transatlantic trade in Africans were considered to be involved in and suffering from maleficent spiritual practices. So the Kanga chant reveals a cosmic imperative that all must be bound to deliver justice from enslavement and to be delivered from evil. It's evil. And to be clear, 
even the righteous power exercised by enslaved Africans against slavery must also be bound, controlled by ethical injunction. So what is the power that must be bound and what is its source? And for that, we have to look at the law. And the law are the spiritual agents that voodoo adepts use to channel cosmic powers. Let me give you a little, a little thing. Can you can you see that that little yeah? So the loi work within a field of power that is mutable, ranging from conquering to reconciliatory, and from disorder to order. And this field, the whole field, is bound by an imperative that even conquering and disordering must not be genocidal in intent or consequence. Now, in the Caribbean reality that voodoo adepts work in, this anti-genocidal imperative has to confront the colonial imperative to dehumanize, desanctify African peoples as things, destroy and, and, and kill out indigenous people. And this is precisely what is genocidal to the plantation system. So let's imagine this field of power with a famous veve, which is a symbol of power in voodoo. And that's this one in front of you, the cosmogram of the cross. Now, the horizontal plane, which marks the manifest domain, the world of where, where, which we live in, is composed of a pole of conquering and a pole of reconciliation. The vertical plane dives into the cosmic waters where Guinea, that's Africa, where Guinea resides. The pole in the waters is a pole of cosmic order, and the other pole out of the water is the pole of disorder. Now, you summon the loi and you channel their power at the point where the lines intersect. But this channeling doesn't have to happen right in the center. It can take place anywhere along the spectrum. So the, the, all the lines can move as long as they're crossing. And they can be composed of various measures then of conquering, reconciliation, order, and disorder. Now, these measures in turn reference a famous delineation of the Loire population into two families, Rada and Petwo. I'm giving you these details, by the way, because when you read um, historical sociologies of Europe, you get massive details, you know, the names of villages and towns and peoples, you know, names of cultural practices and all that. So why shouldn't you and must you not learn these details everywhere? So Rada and Petwa. Now, the Rada family of Loire embody the following characteristics. Cool, pure, calm, gentle, light, high, slow, and lacking in effective power. Petwa Loire are hot, fast, hard, tense, terrible, quick, effectively powerful. Rada Loire bring knowledge of a deeper esoterica than Petwa Loire because Rada are considered closer to Guinea, closer to Africa, which is re-sanctification and rehumanization. But precisely because of his closeness to Guinea, Rada Loa are often described as cold in the manifest realm. They'll only protect you in a passive way, ensuring your survival, but not much else. On the other hand, the knowledge imparted by Petwa Loa is less esoteric, Petwa enable you to channel cosmic forces in a heated fashion. And these loi can be used to expressly manipulate people and matter so as to realize your manifest aim, be it conquering or reconciliatory, destructive or reconstructive. But hot power is always more dangerous to mobilize than cool power because hot power necessarily promotes the advantage of one individual or group over another. And it can tend, can tend towards maleficent spiritual practice, which is associated with slavery, which is genocidal. Okay, well, just to complicate matters, most families of law are composed of both Rada and Petwo members. And this means that each particular cosmic force that the loi manifest in the realm of human beings can be mobilized to cool down, to serve the reproduction and integrity of existing authority, or to heat up, to serve the destruction and transformation of authority. So even if hot power is required for the pursuit of justice and reconciliation, 
it must be bound. Remember that word kanga. It must be bound so it doesn't produce genocidal consequences. Even disordering and conquering have limits. Now, one way of mobilizing hot power is to fashion a poin. And a poin is a point. Taking form as an object or a collection of objects bound together, or even as a kind of spirit, a poin is a concentration of power. It works towards one's personal advantage and provides an ability to surpass others. Now, this original meeting at Bois Cayman, that is a poin. Dutty Bookman, one of the famous priests who preside over it, he announces there that justice must be done on earth as it is in Guinea. But justice here requires a manipulative power. The thing needs to be heated up. So the famous priestess, Cecile Fatiman, undertakes a petwo ritual. She gives a black pig for Ezili Kawulo. And Ezili Kawulo is the loi of secret societies, a righteous avenger of those who refuse her people their humanity. Her chant is one of vengeance, but it's not genocidal in its intent towards whites. It's a chant of bounded justice. Here it is. If I take a child, I'll let him go. But if I take an adult, pow. Now, that's the chant which inaugurates the whole revolution. The question is, did that poem ever finish its work? Were the hot forces bound to cool? Well, it's 1803 and Tucson has been spirited away by Napoleon, whose forces now seem to have control over the revolution. Late in the day, though, Jean-Jacques Dessalines makes common cause with his, between his large army and the still resisting militias of Maroons and African nations, and they all finally drive out the French. Dessalines seals his authority over the revolutionary forces by raising a red and blue flag emblazed with the phrase liberty or death. Now, red and blue are actually the colors of the Ogu family of Loire. And the head of this family, Ogu Ferrai, is not only the Loire of war, courage and heroism, but he's also a blacksmith the archetypal reconciler of conflict. That is what the blacksmith is. And tellingly, Ogul's supplication is fiery rum, which combines both cool, that's water, rada, and hot, fire, petwa. And there's more. Blue is also the color of the Loire called Aizan. And Aizan is the female guardian of the place of one's spiritual birth and a protector against malevolent magic. So Ogul Ferai and Ayazan are working for Dessalines. They grant a manipulative power to him, but one that must be bound in the pursuit of justice against malevolence, eventually to reconcile a new just order. And this new order is announced in the deed of independence, which Dessalines used to commit his generals to freedom or death. And the deed is addressed to the native army, the Armée Andesan. And you might think that's funny. Well, this term purposefully references the long and living history of shared marinage on the island between indigenous Taino and enslaved Africans going all the way back to the 1500s. And in this respect, Andijan proposes an everyday living together to creatively survive. And what's more, the principle of Andijan Living together as humans to creatively survive underpins much of Dessalines' 1805 constitution, the first one of independent Haiti. Now, before the revolution, as Gaminda mentioned, the French slave code, Code Noir, speaks of a different living together, one between slave and master. The Catholic master is supposed to paternally induct the heathen slave into Christianity, but slave remains a slave a lesser human than the master. Think about how that contrasts with Andijan, right? The constitution uses the word noir specifically. It doesn't use negre. It doesn't use negre, which is the usual quotidian term of despoilment. It uses noir because Dessalines' constitution replaces, that. its purpose is to replace the noir in code noir with a new legal arrangement a black abolitionist one based on the principle of Andijan, 
And so Article 14 enfranchises all Haitians as noir with no racialized distinctions, hierarchies or segregations. And the only prescription of residence in Haiti, Article 12, is of the kind that precisely disavows the everyday living together, i.e. white property ship, white property ownership. Even white women and children, remember Ezeli's chant, if I take a child, I'll let, him go. I'll let them go. But if I take an adult, pow! Even these women and children are absent. If they're absent of their white patriarch, they are effectively assured protection. Yet despite all this, the we of Dessalines constitution doesn't actually enunciate a unified peoples, but instead clearly marks a distinction between we, Dessalines and his generals, the authors of the document, and the masses, the recipients of the constitution. So you're like living together, uh, maybe not when it comes to ruler and ruled. And what's more, the flag that Dessalines provides in Article 20 of his constitution is no longer blue and red, but black and red. And this particular color combination represents secret societies. And, and, and it's the one with the, um, the, the Tonton Makutsis later. It's not that secret societies are essentially purveyors of maleficent spiritual practices, as Ili Kawulu is their patron after all, but still, Aizan, the protector against malevolent magic, she's now gone, as is Ogu Ferai, the reconciler. So the flag announces the emperor of Haiti, and he's an emperor, as more of a conqueror of his own people too, or at least one who is concentrating all the power to his advantage. Now, this significant contradiction between unity and segregation, between living together and self-advantage, how to explain it? Well, it might be that in 1803, Dessalines inherits or takes the Puen fashion 12 years prior at Bois Cayman because he's got to reconcentrate power. In the intervening years, the revolution has been militarily encircled by slaveholding powers in order to be put down once and for all. And facing such a threat, Dessalines, as did Toussaint Louverture before him, he must uphold a new plantation system that by force ties formerly free peoples back to the sites of their prior enslavement. There, they produce crops to be exported in exchange for weapons, for defense, paradoxically against the slaveholding armies. So Dessalines' concentration of power is heated up even more by the inter-imperial context, which requires him to continue slavery-like, genocidal-like exploitation of his own peoples. Yet what I really want to point out is that Dessalines still seeks to bind, remember that ethical injunction of Kanga, he still wants to bind this terrible hot power by constitutionalizing the principle of living together, noir on Dijan, right? And, and making this principle stand autonomous to his own imperial authorship. That's why it's very clear in the constitution, it's Dessalines and his generals, then it's the peoples. Now that binding fails, Jean-Jacques is soon murdered by other generals, perhaps in competition over possession of the point. The codification of all Haitians as equally noir disappears in subsequent constitutions. But still, the space of living together is now provided by the peoples themselves, extra constitutionally, through what is called the Lacou model of cooperative land management. And it's that model that spreads across the rural areas it's a maroon-like autonomy to the predatory elites of the Haitian state and imperial powers overseas. Haiti is perhaps the only major polity in the Americas to redistribute plantation land to everybody after abolition. Its example is ceded to the winds, to Bolivar as he frees South America, to Frederick Douglass in North America as he asks what is the 4th of July to the slave, to William Wordsworth in England as he poeticizes natural powers, to the Republic of Guinea in West Africa and its experiment with negritude, even traveling as far as Aotearoa in New Zealand, touching down there in the 1860s as the exemplary revolution that Maori people should follow against Queen Victoria's settler army. Now, here's another genealogy of civilized restraint, of just war, and of an ethics of life versus genocide. But all we are taught of Haiti 
in international politics is as a failed state that can't be fixed, regardless of all the righteous interventions of the US, Canada, and France. Thanks.